Presbyterian tradition, asking the Holy Spirit to work with us as we encounter Scripture. Spirit, who hovered over the waters of creation's birth, in the form of a dove at Jesus' baptism, who was poured out from the design of fire and wind at Pentecost, come to us, open our hearts and minds, so that we may hear the word of life and be by your power. For you live and reign with the Father and the Son, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the third chapter of Galatians, in which baptism defines the relationship of community. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. and Jacob for that reading. Just a few short days from today, we will be upon the 20th anniversary of 9-11. It was a horrific day where we saw scenes of international barons of finance leaping to their deaths from the upper floors of the World Trade Center as they sought to escape the smoke and flames of the crumbling towers. It was a day where we heard heroic stories of first responders rushing up the stairwells of those very same collapsing towers to save people's lives, even as they risked their own. It is a day now memorialized by many films, a new film called Worth that follows the inevitable lawsuits from such an international debacle in which the question is asked, how can we quantify the value of a human life among people of different professions, such as bankers and firefighters? How can we do that as we settle claims for lives lost? How do we determine the value of a human life? Now, insurance companies and corporate litigators may have an answer to this question. As Michael Keaton's character puts it in the film, the answer according to the law is always a number. But as people who focus our imagination on God's sovereign purpose for creation and our creation within the image of God in that creation, that answer, a number, as in a price, cannot be the answer. the answer. Oh, let us be aware of the definite article. 
that grammatical element of the English language, which identifies a paradigmatic form of a noun. The church, the faith, the truth, the Bible. The definite article is a little bit of the devil, or should I say a devil, in our way of thinking and communicating. Theological education, especially of the progressive Christian movement, could well be understood as a formation in Christian leadership to help us be less certain in how we use the definite article, even while we determine what things like the worth of a human life is. While we may come to seminary certain about things like the truth, the faith, the Bible, it will not take long at Eden Seminary to encounter that we are being challenged to wonder which truth, which faith tradition, which Bible, which Bible? Which Bible? Now, as Dr. Grable, Dr. Letzum, Dr. Taylor, and Dr. McCann will share with you soon, no doubt, there are many Bibles. Not only different translations, but different versions. Many of them all called the Holy Bible, with even different tables of contents. The Bible, much like God, as Reverend Higgins challenged us last week from this very pulpit in her convocation sermon is poly, manifold, many. One form of the Bible I remember discovering while daydreaming in a library during my seminary days, browsing in the stacks, a pastime, by the way, I highly recommend, was a publication of the Bible titled The, Complutum, the Complutensian Polyglot. A, fifth, a, a 16th century publication replete with Hebrew, Latin, Greek, and Aramaic versions of Israel's scripture, all arranged on the same page. What some of us might call the Old Testament. And it is not just that there are many versions of the Bible, but there also are in the text themselves a sort of polymorphous nature. The texts are filled with many different forms and components sourced from different contexts, communities, practices, traditions, and yes, authors. How can this be? Isn't the Bible the word of God? Okay, this is where I am going to get off the train and I will let the experts such as Dr. McCann and not only biblical faculty experts, but also theologians and historians take over. But you get the picture, right? Seminary is an enterprise powerfully devoted to scrutinizing our long held assumptions of foundational claims and understandings. And as you embark on what may already be feeling like an uneasy interrogation of your favorite foundational claims, I promise you that we do not do this to confuse pain or agitate you. But because in this work, we are all oriented away from our certainties and toward greater understanding of others. And we are promised 
of God. This is the space of building empathy, of community, of knowledge and understanding. Today's text is a great example of how the Bible is not the one thing it may appear to be. The text comprises a reference by Paul, a leader in the Jesus movement, through which he is seeking to teach not a single church, but a group of churches in a whole region called Galatia. Paul's reference in this letter comes from a source unknown to us today, which contemporary biblical scholars, such as Stephen J. Patterson, who is the author of a book several of us will read for our contextual education seminars this fall, The Forgotten Creed. These scholars understand this reference to have formed the ancient worship service of the Jesus movement in which new members were baptized into the community. This is a rite still practiced in many different ways, some sprinkling, some immersing in Christian traditions to this day, the rite of baptism. And for Paul's churches, that rite of baptism calls for a new way of understanding oneself in relationship to others. And that perspective is matched ritually by putting on a new garment, like a ceremonial robe of baptism that would symbolize one's new way of being in the world. Here is how Paul puts it. As many of you who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Paul references the church's practice of baptism and experience that folks in the church had shared, perhaps even recently as they had entered the community as a means of drawing them into a common understanding of what it means to belong to Christ, to be a member of the community. Now, one way this teaching is often misunderstood is that people hear Paul's reference to the baptism liturgy, there is no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, as his declaration that in Christ, there are no longer any differences among us. As such, Paul is misunderstood to be calling for a unity in the church that is really more like uniformity. In this misunderstanding, people hear Paul teaching that what it means to be baptized, to be a part of the church, is to give up one's identity entirely. But that is not the case. Elsewhere, Paul celebrates the diversity of Christian community, noting that the church is made up of diverse members with diverse gifts, diverse experiences, who, through the power of Christ's love, are able to work as a single body of many different members. What Paul is calling for in reminding the church that there is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, and male and female, is that in Christ, as members of the same body, we are called to stand in solidarity with one another across lines 
that this world uses to divide us and demean us and destroy us. The world uses these lines to say that some of us are worth more than others. But in baptism, Paul teaches, we are called to be new people. And that newness doesn't mean that we are all the same. It means that we stand together in our differences against the domination systems of this world. Oneness in Christ means we are called to see one another as siblings, heirs of Abraham, endowed with the promises of God, each one of us with a net worth of priceless. Far from an it's all good approach or I don't see color zone or an all lives matter space. Paul is calling for members of the church to understand that in baptism, we no longer belong to systems that exploit differences in culture and ethnicity, socioeconomic class and gender. But rather, we stand in solidarity with others across all that works to divide us and destroy our lives and those of our siblings. In this regard, baptism does not mean that we live in uniformity. Right. It means we stand in solidarity, all for one and one for all. What would the church look like if we understood our mission to be standing in solidarity with those who are demeaned and destroyed by systems of domination, such as racism, classism, sexism, heterosexism, ableism, what would Christian worship and ministry be like if with Paul we lived as though in Christ there is neither Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female? If in Christ we did not divide and destroy one another on the basis of culture and ethnicity, on the basis of class, on the basis of gender, on the basis of nationality. This semester, Reverend Dr. Vitra Weisbaker and the Eden faculty will lead students through contextual learning, both in settings of ministry and in seminars to engage just this question. In each level of progressive Christian leader seminars, and with supervisors in ministry, we will wonder together about these things. We will develop skill in identifying and assessing how structures of domination are constructed in our ministry contexts. We will build skill and courage in our settings to engage in ministries that stand in solidarity with those who suffer and work to resist systems of oppression and domination. In many ways, we will all be learning how to imagine, to embody Paul's teaching that in Christ, there is neither Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female. How to imagine and embody Christian faith as solidarity. We opened the new academic year last week 
and met as we always do, our wonderful entering colleagues in the new class. In the infographic that Sonia Van shared, we learned that those who join us, much as those who have in prior years, are people from many different faith traditions. Some, no faith tradition at all. Many different parts of the country, the region, and the world. We come with varied educational and work backgrounds with many different foundational claims about the Bible, the faith, the truth. In all this diversity, God has given us the opportunity to practice our baptisms, to activate a new certainty above all these other certainties that in the spirit, we may not all be the same. We may believe different things. We may worship differently, but we have been assembled to build capacity yep. to know the net worth of ourselves and one another. All heirs of Sarah and Abraham, all children of the promises of God. Yep. And as we do this, we are promised that we will be strengthened to build communities of people who do the same for God's justice, God's love, and God's glory. Amen. Thank you for a good word. In a moment, our music director, Paul Vasile, is going to lead us with song out to the fountain in the quadrangle. If you've ever looked at that fountain carefully, you'll notice that it is 12 fountains surrounding a single central fountain, representing Christ surrounded by the 12 disciples, and maybe other things as well. After all, there were 12 tribes of Israel, right? So in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul talks about how the Israelites were all baptized in the waters of the Red Sea, right? People called out of systems of division that demeaned them into a new identity as free people, right? Called to stand in solidarity in their difference against those systems. So we are gonna walk out to the fountain and I would invite you to walk through the fountain as if you are walking through the waters of the Red Sea from slavery into freedom, from one identity into another, remembering that we have been called out. We have been called together. We have been called to resist by our baptism, in our baptism. It is possible to walk through that fountain without getting wet. And we, we scrubbed it so it would not be slippery. So take your time. You can get through without getting wet. If you're worried about your shoes, you can take your shoes off. We will be happy to let you do that. And if, and if you are just not sure today, you're welcome to just walk around the edge and meet us on the other side. There's no one that says you have to do it right? But as you walk through, I invite you not just to think about your baptism, but to listen to the sound of the water, listen to the roaring of the Red Sea. I invite you, if you want, to touch that water, to feel it, to sense 
the movement, the sense of being called into a movement in our baptism. We'll meet on the other side and we'll say a prayer and go from there. I invite you to come and walk with us. Friends, as we go, and those who are online, I just want to teach you quickly so you can join with us. Friends, we're going to join in a song, as James Cone says, a repertoire of resistance, a repertoire of resilience from the African-American tradition, wade in the water. And friends, if you can imagine that this song is also an invitation to cross over,
in countless ways you have revealed yourself in ages past and have blessed us with signs of your grace. We praise you that through the waters of the sea, you led your people Israel out of bondage into freedom in the land of your promise. We praise you for sending Jesus, your son, who for us was baptized in the waters of the Jordan and was anointed as the Christ by your Holy Spirit. Through the baptism of his death and resurrection, you set us free from the bondage of sin and death and give us cleansing and rebirth. We praise you for your Holy Spirit, who teaches us and leads us into all truth, filling us with a variety of gifts that we might live out the gospel in all places and serve you as a royal priesthood. We rejoice that you claimed us in our baptism and that by your grace, we are born anew. By your Holy Spirit, renew us that we may be empowered to do your will and continue forever in the risen life of Christ to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever, amen.